Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting webinar. My name is Kenny Coogan, and I'm part of the specialist group, Anteater Sloth and Armadillos, which is part of the International Union of Conservation of Nature. And we're really excited to have Monique Poole on today to talk about Suriname's Xenarthrins. But first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our organization. We uh, focus on Xenarthrins, which include all the armadillos, sloths, and anteaters. If you go to our website, xenarthrins.org, you can learn about each of the species. We are also on social media. This is our Instagram and Facebook account, and we have a brand new YouTube page. And in about a week, this webinar and last week's webinar will be posted, so stay tuned for that. Um, if you go to our Facebook page under the event tab, you can see all of our upcoming webinars. And if you go to our uh, website, zenarthrins.org, there's a little education tab at the top, and that also lists all of the upcoming webinars. If you feel so inspired after listening to today's webinar, you can go to the donation tab, and the donations will directly support Zenarthra conservation. The webinar series is part of a new arm for our specialist group. It's our education arm. And we would like to thank our partner institutions, FIA, the Foundation for International Aid to Animals, and Nurtured by Nature for helping fund the education arm, which includes webinars. And very shortly, we will be posting uh, worksheets and children activities, as well as some animated videos for you to use uh, when you're doing outreach. So if you're attending this webinar live, please, at the very bottom of the Zoom, use the chat function to type your questions for Monique. And then at the end, I will uh, funnel them and collate them, and then I will ask them to Monique. So thank you. We're I, I'm always surprised by how many people can attend these live webinars because we just started them. So I appreciate everybody who is here live. And now I'm going to turn it over to Monique. Hello, oh, good evening everybody. And thank you, Kenny, for the, the short introduction so that everybody knows if, if they have questions, they can type them in the uh, box, the chat box. And I'll try to answer them at the end, if I can. But before anything else, I would like to thank you, Kenny, for uh, and the Ant Eater and Slot and Armadillo Specialist Group for hosting this event. I'm grateful to be part of the IACN Xenarthra Specialist Group and thank all our volunteers, our partner Wealthy Shoots Gesellschaft, and all our donors who are helping to make our work possible. Before I start, I would like to get, do Thanksgiving. Um, today I'm in Paramaribo, Suriname, on the unceded land, originally inhabited by the Kalinya and Tokono. And some centuries ago, my ancestors migrated to these regions, most of them involuntary or lured under false pretenses. We are also in the ecosystem of the coast of Suriname with its rich and unique biodiversity of the mangrove, swamp and marsh forests. Along our coast lies the North Brazil shelf large marine ecosystem stretching from the Caribbean Sea in Central America to the Parnaiba River in Brazil. And its rich biodiversity and oxygen producing uh, plankton support the coastal area of Suriname with its rich fauna and flora. And we thank these natural ecosystems for the life they make possible in this part of the world. So I'm delighted to be here and share the work we do in Suriname with all of you. My name is Monique Paul and I'm the founder and director of the Green Heritage Fund Suriname. And I was not trained as a biologist um, or a veterinary doctor, but I've been working with Xenatrans in Suriname for the past 17, 18 years almost now. And so for that reason, I prefer to refer to myself as a naturalist and next to helping Sinatrans, 
My most important mission is to change people's minds and attitudes towards oxenatrans living in Suriname by connecting them to these animals and the habitats in which they live in a manner that impacts these people's soul and spirit rather than their mind. So with the work we do, we contribute to a number of sustainable development goals. Um, one is uh, good health and well-being. And it is impossible to see this goal only from a human perspective. We all have to realize that the health of the environment and the animals living in it is intrinsically related to human health and well-being. And for that reason, we focus in our work on what is called wildlife welfare and individual animal welfare of the animals we work with, and not exclusively on conservation. And this is what is this is part of what is called um, one health, one welfare. So we also are involved in uh, quality education. Uh, by educating in formal and informal settings about the animals we work with and the habitats in which they live. With regard to sustainable cities and communities, um, cities without green are not sustainable. And this, you will better understand this when I tell a little bit about this later on uh, in my presentation. With regard to climate action, our animals are directly impacted by climate change. And I will also go deeper into that in my presentation. And we are actively working also on climate change actions in the sense of um, uh, education. Then of course, life on land. Um, all extant sinatrans are land dwelling animals. And this group includes sloths, anteaters and armadillos. And it is one of the basal clades of placental mammals. And these animals are almost exclusively South American with the exception of the nine banded armadillo, but everybody who looked at Jim Lovery's um, webinar last week knows this. And this super order has a fossil history of at least 65 million years. 17 partnerships for the goals. Uh, it's obvious that without partners such as Welty Schutz Gesellschaft, ASASG, and the partners again of ASASG and many other partners, we cannot achieve the sustainable development goals. So Suriname is located in the region known as Amazonia and more in particular, in it's part of the Guyana Shield. And the Guyana Shield underlies all of Northeastern South America and covers a broad area between the Atlantic Ocean the Orinoco and the Amazon River. And it is shared between Brazil, French Guiana, Suriname, Guyana, Venezuela, and Colombia. It is one of the oldest, most stable geologic uh, formations in the world. And Suriname is still covered in lush, pristine rainforest. Um, we have almost 93% of our territory still um, covered in beautiful forest. We are the only local organization, um, I think up till now in the Guyanas, involved exclusively in Xenatran conservation. And uh, we do, uh, as I will explain later, rescue care, rehabilitation and release, as well as basic research. In French, and Guyana, uh, French Guyana and Guyana, there's also a lot of research uh, going on, but the type of work we do with rehabilitation and um, that, that I don't think exists in the two other Guyanas. So we have two species of slots in Suriname. Uh, one is the pale throated tree fingered slot or the Bradypus tridactylus, and this is an infant. And this is an infant with its mother um, and another infant with its mother. Uh, this is a juvenile of around uh, two years old. And it, uh, the last one is a male. And in this species, we have a sexual dimorphism. And that is beautifully seen in the patch here of this male three-fingered slot. And they each have a unique identifying spot on their back, uh, the males. But um, actually, the 
the pattern in their fur is also unique for each animal. The species uh, as an adult is on average 45 centimeters from nose to tail and they weigh around three and a half kilograms. Uh, I think the biggest one I've ever weighed was four kilograms. And they are supposed to live up to 25 to 30 years. Uh, they're mostly diurnal, but they can also be active during the night. And its diet consists of leaves, mostly leaves, and sometimes flowers or fruits of different trees and vines. Uh, the distribution of the Bradypus tridactylus is, oh, there it is. Is limited to the Guyana Shield, as uh, reported by Maurice Barros et al. in 2010. And in Suriname, this species is assumed to occur throughout the whole territory. But, and I will say a little bit more about that later on. So the other slot we have, oh, oh sorry, that's not the slot we have. Um, actually, I want to share this. Um, um, poem with you, uh, because it's a fun poem that was um, written by Theodore Rotke. And the I think the animal that this was written for is the three-fingered sloth. And that's, that's why I wanted to um, uh, share this, because the two species are rather different. Uh, actually, they are very different. And um, the picture you see here is of an animal that I've now been observing for the past six months. And he's always sitting in a completely um, bare, it looks like a dead tree. And I, I think it's a dead tree. So it's a bit of a risky business, in my opinion, but he apparently doesn't think so. He sits here and it is far from a road. So everybody can see the animal. Uh, but Apparently he likes to sit there and he's huge. Um, I, I don't have the little film that I have of him so that you can see where, uh, how far he's sitting, but I've never seen an animal this big. So the other sloth we have is called Linnae's uh, two-fingered sloth. Um, and this is a, a baby. Uh, we have a lot of babies of these, uh, um, well, two fingered slots. Um, this is another one. This is at our center. This is one uh, together with its mother. We were called. They were somewhere in the middle of the city eating the two of them, and people called us to to remove them. And they they are actually very um, fast. Uh, they are very different. Um, Interesting uh, in this picture, and I think you saw it also in the three-fingered uh, slot picture that the baby was not sitting on the mother. So what they do when they eat, uh, and this is something I've observed, is they will go off the mother, eat, but as soon as the mother starts moving, they run really quickly or run, well, uh, weird thing to say quickly in connection to a slot, I guess. Uh, but they could go very fast back to the mother and cling to them, and uh, they then will flee the scene, so to say. So um, the, the animal itself is much larger than the three-finger uh, slot and grows to around 58 to 70 uh, centimeters large, and it weighs between four and nine kilograms. I think most of them are more towards the nine. And they live to be, we think, 15 to 20 years old. There is a big um, um, population in captivity, uh, which is not true for the three-fingered slot. So they, they're much faster than the three-fingered slot, and they can be quite defensive. So they, they, they're very good at defending themselves in the sense even that they will not just be um, captured. They will actually, normally when you approach a wild animal, they, they will go away from you. I've had a lot of situations where the animal actually comes towards me. And uh, I can tell you, when you're in a tree, sitting in a tree, 
trying to remove the animal. Um, it's very scary because they're much better at climbing and, uh, you know, holding on than we are. And so this has happened uh, more than once. Uh, now I'm doing this in a much um, safer manner with a net. So they are um, a nocturnal animals and uh, they are sometimes awake during the day, but it's not normal. And they have a very varied diet. They eat both leaves and uh, fruits. And in my experience, they look at the world almost always upside down. So for me, if I would see a two-fingered sword looking at me, like I'm looking now at you or at the screen at least, that would be strange. So um, they would actually do this, and I'm not sure if I'm not going to fall off my chair, but they will always look like that. Um, I can't even do it because, of course, I'm not a sloth. Um, and uh, the three-fingered sloth is different because they always look at you like we look you know, with our eyes on top, but the two-fingered slot always hangs upside down. So the distribution of the, oh, yeah. One thing I still want to say, um, they have really sharp teeth uh, and I can tell you they can bite pretty um, hard. They have these um, teeth in their, Mouth. I'm, I'm not sure because it's always for me um, surprising to see how they eat the food because they, they can actually eat very hard, uh, unripe mangoes. Um, and that's quite amazing because they only have like these uh, four incisors to uh, bite in the mangoes. And so they eat other hard things and they, they actually can uh, do a lot of harm if they bite you. So their distribution is much more extensive than um, the three-fingered slot. The three-fingered slot, as you saw, was really only distributed in a very small part of um, uh, South America, uh, the three Guyanas, Brazil, and um, a small part of Brazil and a small part of Venezuela. Um, but the two-fingered slot is goes much for, further than, the, and I, I think this is the so is this one the specific the Linnaeus uh, two-fingered slot because the other one then and I think we will hear about that more in next in the next webinar um, is that so there's an, a different species that overlaps a bit with the distribution of this one. So what happens really often to me is that people think that the slots that we capture in the city are brought to the city. So uh, the question I get asked really often is, so slots wander into the city and then I pick them up because somebody took it from the road, who, uh, brought it to the city and then let it go. Uh, that's not the case. They actually live here. Um, they um, are the original inhabitants of this um, location. Uh, the, the map that I'm showing is um, a maximum entropy map that was created for the potential distribution of the three-fingered slot. Uh, it shows that they would occur more towards Guyana than to Suriname, but what is not included here is the forests uh, on the coast. So I think we need to do this again, this uh, niche mo uh, ecological niche modeling, so that we can, um, I think, establish that they would be where the forests are, the three-fingered slots at least, because um, we have a lot of intact forests on our coast. Um, all rapid um, biological assessments that were done in the interior of Suriname, um, they actually didn't see any sloth. None of the reports um, have uh, three or two-fingered slots in there. So that's quite surprising. 
So I think they are actually occurring the, in, more, in a higher density in the coastal area. But um, it's of course a little bit problematic that if this is their most ideal location to be, because this is where we are as well. And so their habitat is really um, very fragmented because of that. And so the animal that you see walking there, um, that yeah, it's just, they are losing their habitat a lot. We, we actually had two calls in the past week, actually yesterday and the day before that. One was of an otter that was running somewhere in the streets. And the other one was a, a porcupine. And we went to that area and there's so much urbanization, so much urban sprawl that it's really sad for these animals to lose their habitat um, so quickly. Um, what are the threats that they face? So, And this is for the Bradypus didactylus and Colopus didactylus, the, the two-fingered and three-fingered slots. I, I'm not talking that much about um, the anteaters. We do work also with anteaters. Uh, there are three species in Suriname. We almost never have uh, anything to do with armadillos um, because first of all, they are not protected under Surinamese law. And second, um, they're really nocturnal. So we don't see them as much. And I hope that in the future we can work with the specialist group to learn a little bit more about the, the armadillos in Suriname, of which there are five, of which only one is protected. All anteaters and all slots are fully protected under the law in Suriname. So killing and capturing is of course um, not allowed, as I said, because they are fully protected. But still people do this and they post it even on Facebook. Um, so they are under increasing uh, pressure also because of urban expanding. Um, this is a lot, especially now in the dry season, we see a lot of um, land conversion, not just in the urban area, but also in rural areas in the coastal zone. And it's not very sustainable the way the natural resources are being used. Then pet wildlife conflict. Um, both animals that you see in these pictures, the three-fingered and the two-fingered slot, both were in contact with the dog. Um, the three-fingered slot broke its arm. Uh, it stayed with us for three, I think in total three months um, and it healed and it was released. The two-fingered slot, even though they're very fast, they can be very aggressive, they are no, uh, in this case, they, it was Rottweilers. They are no, um, they, they don't stand a chance against a Rottweiler. And so this, this poor animal was dead when we arrived. And I must say pet wildlife conflict is now increasing uh, a lot. I think almost 50% of all the rescues we do are pet wildlife conflicts now. Then we have the infrastructure, the roads, the power lines, houses. Um, we do a lot of rescues of animals that are either in a power line. Fortunately, um, not that many electrocutions. I'm not sure why that is, um, luck, I guess, but a lot of power lines were, um, are covered, I think. So that, that could be the reason why it's not um, such a big problem. Um, this person couldn't leave his house because uh, there was a slot hanging from it, as you can see. And um, we, we uh, removed it so they could um, go to work. Forest fragmentation in urban areas. This is a beautiful picture to show that 
Um, the forest you see on the right is actually all, only a small patch of forest, I think at the most 50 hectares. Um, and it's in the middle of Paramaribo. So it's not somewhere, you know, uh, it may have a connection. I think this part doesn't have a connection to other green areas. So the animals cannot really uh, move away and slots don't move away anyway. So they would rather move towards the houses and then we, they get in trouble with, with, uh, uh, with the dogs and with the humans. So then there is a decrease in flora biodiversity. This is something uh, very interesting because in 1975, a lot of people left Suriname when we became on the independent. They left their agricultural land. And ever since, you know, secondary vegetation came up. But the secondary vegetation is not fit for these animals. So although it looks as if Suriname and Greater Paramaribo has become greener in the past period, um, it didn't, at least not with vegetation that was um, fit for um, Bradypus tridactylus or Colopus didactylus. So I'm going to now tell you a little bit about Xenatras. And especially, actually we had all, all groups that came in in 2019. We had a very high mortality uh, during a period of extreme drought, something that's quite unusual in Suriname. Uh, so unusual that um, I actually started taking pictures when I noticed that it looked like um, the North, like Holland or places like that where you have fall. Uh, leaves actually were falling off the trees, which basically meant that the animals did not have anything to eat. I mean, that I had never thought uh, about how it would affect slots and, and all these animals, but I now know how climate change is going to affect them. At this moment, it's very, and that's why I'm starting with this, um, it's very hot in Suriname. Um, we are, I, I think the, the sun is passing over the equator, so it's very close. We are at five, six degrees, and it's just 35, 36 degrees, but it feels really hot, um, more so than in other years. Um, so this is a little bit how it looked. It was not because somebody sprayed pesticides, it's just drought, three months, no rain. Um, and what we then saw also is that um, there were small fires as well. Um, not even because people were dumb enough to uh, put fire to something, but just because it was so hot and maybe there was glass around and it started burning. So uh, drought, small fires, we've not had wildfires yet in Suriname. Uh, but let's hope it also never comes. The other thing that happened was um, a strange hard winds. Uh, so um, unexpected that it basically uh, broke the trees. And uh, this is the first year, um, 2019 is when this happened. So we had a lot of um, trees that basically um, well, lost their tops. But this year, for the first time, I actually saw a tree that had fallen and there was a dead slot on it um, because they can't move anywhere. They are not monkeys. They can't jump when a tree falls. And so um, also with climate change, when this happens, they cannot jump off and you know go away quickly. And so they run the risk of being um, basically uh, 
yeah, getting, well, dying because of the sudden impact. Um, what we saw in the animals, most of them were so dehydrated that even with um, intravenous or um, subcutaneous um, fluids, we couldn't uh, save them anymore. And the other thing that happened, which is, uh, of course, because of the dehydration, uh, we saw that mothers abandoned their uh, babies. So we got a lot of small animals uh, that probably the mothers thought, well, I can't find food, it's too difficult, and I'm abandoning, abandoning my baby. So we had a lot of small animals. Uh, almost all of them died because um, the, yeah, they were in such a bad state. Um, this animal was attacked by a dog because um, he probably was trying to find a better patch of forest. And this animal very weirdly just fell out of a tree. Um, there's uh, actually, I have no explanation for why this happened, but it was in the same period. Um, it had just fallen out of the tree and died. We see a lot of, we had a lot of eye infections in this period for these animals. And that is of course related to dehydration because if they are dehydrated, they cannot uh, uh, have sufficient moisturized uh, eyes. And so they get uh, uh, problems with the eyes. Okay, so that was about climate change, something we should uh, really worry about. Um, especially if we have droughts, but also if we have more storms and winds. So climate change is a threat to Xenatrans. So the other thing I just want to quickly go through is the big slot rescue of 2012. This was an area of 6.8 hectare where we had uh, a lot of animals that we uh, rescued from. 135 tree-fingered slots. Um, this is the area, as you can see, it's in the middle of the city. And so these animals were concentrated in a very small patch um, right there where you see the yellow um, pins. The, we had the collaboration of the owner of the land uh, and the operator of this machine. He try to do it in a, such a way that the animals wouldn't be hurt. So I hope you are not, uh, don't scream when you see this happening, but. Well, as you can see, and that was quite an impact for the animal. Uh, it did survive, uh, didn't die, fortunately. And I think that is what makes them so special, that they can sustain these types of impacts. Um, so this is the, the, the work. We were on the land for two months. Uh, with a lot of volunteers, with uh, game wardens who came to help us. As you can see, the operator did help. He, he became a bit impatient at the end of this whole um, uh, exercise because it because he was helping us, his work took much longer um, because he had to pay attention to the animals. 
the two fingered slots uh, we didn't all catch them because they were so much faster um, than the three fingered slots um, but we did catch a number of them but not all some of them managed to escape as well as the anteaters and when i say anteaters i'm speaking specifically about the um, the tamandua the the the, the lesser anteaters because the um, silky anteaters they are like the three fingered slot they just stay put and they can't move and so they they remain behind like the porcupines also very slow so they they can't really jump or run away they're just too slow for that so it was a very interesting period we had a lot of babies um, at that point in time I didn't know how to match up babies with adults. Now I would have known how to do that. And so what happened is that we ended up with a lot of small animals that actually should have been um, with, with, matched up with their parents, so to say. Uh, a lot of them survived, fortunately, but we had too many. Um, and everything you see in these pictures is from a period when we had less knowledge about how to do things. So for example, we were handling the animals um, with our bare hands. Um, of course, these are babies, but there are things in here that we wouldn't be doing now. We were also exposing them to a lot of uh, humans while doing this. Again, this would not be happening uh, if I had to do it over again. Uh, we did receive a permit from the uh, the ministry that is um, uh, responsible for this to to collect some basic data and to take some uh, genetic or some blood samples so we could do a genetic analysis. We did uh, do this together with Nadia uh, from Brazil. She did a basic um, analysis but we would need to do a more extensive analysis and add more with other animals from other plots, uh, from other places where we um, get them. So we measured uh, 60 animals in total. We took 60 blood samples. Uh, the vets looked at animals that needed um, care. There were not many animals with um, problems. We gave them a number and then we released them. This is uh, some of the animals in my house, the small ones. There were two adult uh, females that were in the house. One had the, a wound and that's why she sat there and she was always very patient. And all the little ones were always like sitting on top of her and uh, she was a very kind um, surrogate mother for them. So that was quite something. We did write up a paper that was published uh, later on and in Edentata 17. So you can read more about this um, big rescue. So the work we are still doing that has continued, we moved out of my house with all the animals. So we have a very beautiful um, rehab center uh, next to a very beautiful forest. And we're actually only finding out now how beautiful this forest is because there's a number of transects that were uh, set out. Uh, there's some tree identifications. One of the best known um, tree specialists of uh, Suriname came to our forest and he's just said to us, this forest is maybe a thousand years old. It's a very beautiful marsh forest. And I, I'm, I'm smiling a little bit when I say marsh forest because a marsh forest really is different from the forest we see in the interior. One of the things that makes it very different is lots of mosquitoes. So we continue with all the rescues that we're doing. We sometimes get very special uh, cases. Uh, this one was an animal that was brought to us by a family who saw it crossing a road when they were coming from uh, uh, 
the airport and they um, put it in a hammock and then put it in the back of the car next to their old aunt. And uh, I'm always surprised to see that no more accidents happen, actually. Um, I don't think I would be so... Um, I, I would just be sitting next to a two-fingered slot that was not really in a cage because they're not that friendly, especially if they're stressed. So we do rescue animals. Uh, in most cases, we call the fire brigade or the uh, energy company. We work together. They uh, take the animals down and we bring the animals to the forest. Uh, so we so sometimes also have, uh, of course, anteaters, as I said, actually quite often. We sometimes have very small animals that uh, stay with us for uh, until they are adults. And I must say with uh, anteaters, they are quite independent. So once they become adult, they will come and go, but at a certain moment, they won't come back. So they really uh, stay in the forest. Would be nice to track them so that we can see what, where they are, what they're doing. Um, the slot care um, also entails uh, medical care. So we, we work with uh, eight, eight, in total eight uh, veterinary doctors that we trained. Um, two experts from the specialist group came down to um, Suriname. Um, one to teach about the medicine of uh, slots, the other to teach about the med medicine of uh, anteaters. And uh, I need to talk to Mariella to see when she can come and maybe not teach about the medicine of uh, armadillos, but about doing armadillo research in Suriname. Uh, we release the animals. Some of the animals we release um, on the other side of the river. Uh, it's an uninhabited part, piece of land, uh, no, not owned by anybody. So um, we don't want to uh, let all the animals um, go in the same patch of forest. So we, we spread it out a little bit. Although I must say the forest behind our center is very safe. This is an anteater baby that we are releasing. And we do a lot of uh, educational work. Uh, this is a, a mural that we use when people visit our center to explain a little bit about the animals and also show the sizes. And uh, we hope to continue doing this and maybe grow even bigger with the real visitor center because now it's a little bit like letting people come to a hospital to see animals. So I think it would be better if we had a separate visitor center where the animals are not that need to recover, so to say. They, they are not exposed to, to humans. So I think that's for me um, what I can share with you. Actually, I can share a lot more with you, but I think it's nice if we can uh, go to some questions, maybe. Um, there's still so much we don't know. Um, one of the things I just explained to you, there's this animal that's sitting in the street, and I want to know what he's doing there. What is his secret? Because if I was a harpy eagle, it look, looks for me like he would be a perfect, victim you know nice snack but he is huge that means that he's been very successful with this strategy of climbing up in a dead tree sitting exposed so that all harpy eagles can see him so it's it's uh, amazing actually uh, to see these animals um, um, we don't really know yet um, who they are and what they do. I have a lot of nice anecdotes to share with you, but I think that can maybe happen when we um, do some questions and answers. Good? Yes, very good. Thank you so much. That was excellent. 
Claire Nam looks beautiful and all the work you do is really incredible. We do have a couple of questions. Um, Christian wants to know how many animals do you have um, now and how many animals do you average like per year other than the bad years like 2012? Yes, so um, on average, we have two to three rescues a week. But I must say, we sometimes have very quiet uh, periods. Uh, we don't know what it is. The beginning of this year, we had very few uh, rescues. And we were teasing one of the interns that came especially for, you know, helping with slots. And it was quite amazing because she was entering data for the past five years for all our rescues. So she knew that we had always rescues, except now for the moment that she was there. <laughs> Three months, we almost had no rescues. And then in May, I had 21 in one month. And that's almost daily one. So it is very variable and we need to do some more work on our data to find out if there are correlations. There is definitely a correlation between um, droughts and um, or dry periods and the, the number of animals we get. But I, it's really difficult to say. Um, but on average, it's like 150 animals per year that we... Um, have to um, move, so to say. And um, the other question was? Is how many you have currently? Currently, we have uh, one animal. And I'm almost ashamed to say it, but it's a failed rehabilitation animal. This animal is a two-fingered slot. And from the start, she was a bit strange. Very, I mean, you're going to laugh if I say it. She was very lazy, extremely lazy. And um, we were like, okay, this is not really normal. And now she's an adult. She's almost four years old. And every time we try to soft release her, she just comes back to the building. And yeah, she, she lives now under our roof, basically. Um, and uh, five o'clock is normally the feeding time. She comes down and she just looks at the, the animal caretaker until she gets her food. Uh, so that's uh, unfortunately not a success story, but we have another one that we've uh, moved out. So there's two animals at the center at this moment. Uh, we, we hardly have uh, a lot of animals because our main goal is really to rehabilitate them and let them go. So it's not full of animals in our center. But you can see animals around the center because there are animals that live around because we've released a lot of animals. And they don't feel threatened by us, so they, they just live in the trees around the center. Did you say that sloths can't live in newly planted forests? So what, what happens is uh, there was uh, basically pasture or agricultural land that uh, was no longer used. And so um, this secondary vegetation came up and they, they can't live in that. So in that picture that I showed, there was like one small part of original forest because we were called actually to this place uh, because they were going to um, deforest and the people wanted us to remove the animals. And so I drove over with the game warden and we arrived there and we both look and say, oh no, there's nothing going to be here. Only on the back of the land where there was a small, maybe like, uh, one hectare or even less of land that had never been cut. So that was still original marsh uh, forest. And I think we had only one animal in the end from that whole area. 
did that animal migrate or was it from the original forest? Oh, no, I think it was from that original forest and because they uh, raised it down, um, we, we, we removed it, yeah. Christian has a follow-up. Do you have support from the government to do this type of work? Yes and no. Um, I do uh, work closely with the government, but we do need to have a permit to do this work. So you cannot just work without permit. And I think in most countries, you know, there's a permitting if you work with the protected species. So um, in the sense of uh, getting um, subventions, if that's also maybe what Christian is referring to, no, there is no uh, financial support uh, from the government for this type of work. Um, and I, I think it's a bit problematic in the sense that if you have an animal that's protected under your laws, then you should somehow also be able to guarantee that protection. Yeah. Do you have how much land do you have to cover? And is there another rehabilitation center in Suriname? Or? So we uh, basically work exclusively in the um, coastal zone, uh, but we sometimes get animals that were found on the road to uh, the reservoir, which is uh, the interior already. And we will, we will actually drive either to the complete west or complete east of the country to pick up animals that are in need. But I think 90, 98% of our animals, maybe even 99% are all from Paramaribo, which is our capital city. Yeah. The urban sprawl, which is where which is everywhere, it's a global problem. Yes. Auk would like to know, do you have any data on invertebrate spree species associating with Xenarthrins in Suriname? Uh, no, and uh, actually this is an interesting question because um, whenever I read all the articles and uh, especially from, I think mainly Costa Rica and Panama, the animals have, um, either moths uh, in their fur, or they have a completely algae-grown uh, fur. We don't see that here in Suriname. Um, I recently saw um, a film, somebody sent it to me, and I, I don't remember exactly what the, the reason is, but something else caught my attention is that when I was looking at the animal, I suddenly saw a lot of moths <laughs> walking over the fur. Yeah. And we never have that in Suriname. We don't see the uh, moths in their fur. I think I've had it only once or twice. Um, so it's very different. So uh, it was actually one of the things I didn't mention is that slot is not one species. You know, it's, it's not... Um, uh, and it's also clear now that even if um, if you say three-fingered slots all over the place are more or less the same, I think the environment in which they live, I think Costa Rica is much more humid than Suriname, mm -hmm. which some people won't believe because it's very <laughs> humid. Um, and so they do have this very different um, yeah, ecology in their fur. Yeah. Yeah, I know that you mentioned you had a three month drought, but I, I guess the humidity would prevent moss and algae also from growing. Yeah. Um, no, I think it doesn't help. So I, I'm not sure what, what it is. So this is one of the questions that we need to answer, I think. Uh, there's a lot of gaps that we still have in research and in knowledge. And I think this is one of the, the things that we need to look in. So why do they have so much, you know, I've seen pictures of slots with 
algae in their fur. And I'm thinking, I've never seen that in Suriname, <laughs> never. And I can tell you, I've seen a lot of the, these animals. All right, so Monique, we, got one, we have one minute and we have uh, at least one question. We have two questions. So uh, speaking of maybe we need more research, uh, Jeannie would like you to talk a little bit more about that there's more two-toed sloths in captivity. I think you were kind of implying that people don't keep three-fingered sloths. In yeah, the so North what I, yeah, what I specifically was uh, um, referring to there was that in the um, uh, zoos, Abroad, you will find two fingered sloths because they're omnivores. So they, they eat anything, yeah. uh, almost anything, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, and so they are very easy to keep in that sense in captivity. So we also then know more about how long they survive, at least in captive, uh, you know, in a captive uh, situation. Um, with three fingered sloths, I think only, I think in Ecuador, they have. Uh, three fingered slots in the zoo. And I think there's a zoo in the US, or used to be at least in uh, Texas, I think, that has three fingered slots. But from what I know is that the animals don't really survive that well, and they need to regularly replace the, the three fingered slots. Because they, they are very specific for their habitat. So they eat what where they live, so they local force. Yeah? So it's not that, um, um, it's not, you can't expect them to survive that easily like two finger slots. So that's basically. All that's right, very good. I uh, just wanted to add that uh, Bradipus tridactylus in Brazil is known to have dung beetles in their fur, as well as, Many other things. I, I wonder um, whether it's really Bradypus tridactylus or whether it's variegatus, because a lot of the studies from um, uh, the past, um, they, they said it was tridactylus, but then later on, uh, Nadia uh, actually established that they were wrongly identified. And so they may have been variegatus. And mm -hmm. I've never seen it, uh, Auke, I think only once. And if you go to our zenartherans.org slash education, or if you go to our Facebook page, you can see upcoming webinars. And we want to thank you so much, Monique. It was wonderful. And we're getting a couple of comments that also say it's wonderful. And uh, I hope everyone has a good day. Bye-bye.